I beg to move this House to now adjourn. The question is, this House to now adjourn. Drew Hendry. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. You and the uh, House will be aware that I have raised the issue of universal credit in this place many times uh, over the issues that are faced, the problems that are faced by my constituents and uh, others across the nations of the UK. Uh, this debate is about universal credit and its effect on the terminally ill. And I must say, Mr Deputy Speaker, this has been preparing for this has been one of the most humbling experiences uh, of my parliamentary uh, career so far. And I, I would like to spe pay special tribute to uh, Marie Curie, uh, to the Macmillan uh, Highland um, Citizens Advice Bureau Partnership and to the MND Association for their input, but especially to those uh, terminally ill uh, claimants um, who have come forward uh, with their um, stories of the issues they have faced. Stories of delays, of difficulties, the deficits they face as disabled people, the complexities and frustrations that confront them, the humiliations and indignity that they have to suffer. And these, Mr Deputy Speaker, are actually very simple things for this government to fix. At some at little or no cost um, to the government. And if the Chancellor is sincere in what he said during the budget that he wanted a civilised and tolerant place that cares for the vulnerable, he will take on board the representations that I'm making on behalf of those agencies and the terminally ill tonight. I will give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way and, and congratulate him for securing uh, this debate and yeah. commend him for the work that he has done over many years uh, highlighting the problems with universal credit. He mentions the Chancellor's budget. Of course, that was an admission that universal credit uh, was failing some of the constituents and some of the people that he mentions. Does he think that the Chancellor now and the, the Government now need to go further to address the real issues at the heart of universal credit, such as those that he mentions tonight? Yeah. 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 Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, we all accepted the principle of a simpler uh, benefit and the move to a single payment, uh, but that simplification does not work if it is not simple for the users, if it becomes complex, uh, which is what we have, and difficult. And as my honourable friend pointed out, I have been raising issues over universal credit since 2013 as then High, uh, Leader of Highland Council, where we took universal credit through the pilot. Uh, onto live service and then finally onto full service rollout. During that time, we have spotted and reported the problems that have been thrown up by this. None of it, until very recent weeks, has actually been taken on board. And as my honourable friends pointed out, we have recently seen an admission, however grudgingly, from the government um, that there are problems, that it is broken. And the Minister has an opportunity tonight to fix some of the other areas where it is broken. Prior to universal credit being introduced, uh, personal independence payments had a spef specified line uh, for the, to call for those who are terminally ill. Uh, claimants on PIP uh, who, are, who were terminally ill had their payments processed quickly and payments could be made uh, weekly. Implicit consent was available, giving supporting organisations the authority to make claims on behalf of a terminally ill claimant. Many Terminally ill people simply do not want to be told if they are dying. Uh, this is, this, when PIP was available, allowed them some consideration and dignity. <coughs> I will give way. Yes. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman, first of all, for, for uh, I ask permission to, uh, to get an intervention. I thank him for that. But also, I thank him for bringing this matter to the House for consideration. Uh, and would the, member, the Honourable Member agree that, as, in the same way which DLA had special rules for the terminally ill, there must there has to be compassionate grounds in the universal credit that are able to be adapted to individual circumstances, because each person has individual circumstances specific to themselves. I thank the honourable, honourable gentleman for making that point. I will come on to underline that uh, further in my speech. Mr Deputy Speaker, I held in my constituency a universal credit summit specifically to challenge the accusations that were coming from those benches about scaremongering, and I invited every single 
Tory MP and the ministers and indeed the Prime Minister to come to Inverness to hear testimony from agencies, from claimants about the problems of universal credit. Had they attended, they would have heard from Elaine Donnelly, the uh, case worker at the Highland uh, Macmillan uh, Citizens Advice Bureau Partnership. Uh, she has been dealing with universal credit cases uh, for cancer patients and the terminally ill. She describes herself as, through the number of claimants and the difficulties they are having, as battle-weary, numb with the uh, number uh, and type of claims that are coming forward, of the fact that people are dying before their claims are actually processed. She told us of a, client, a claimant diagnosed with cancer, not knowing the outcome of her claim, uh, with no support for six weeks, and welcome the tiny reduction to five weeks, by the way, but it actually took three months to get her payment. And when it came through, it was wrong. And a £500 deduction uh, was made for another benefit that was never even claimed or received. Other claimants included uh, Lucy, a 22-year-old, who missed a deadline, it stopped her PIP, her mobility, uh, blue badge was lost, and her mum's carer's allowance was taken away, and it was hard work to sort that out. Joanne's dad uh, was, uh, was told there was nothing more the doctors could do in April 2016, and he was moved from DLA to PIP that summer. He received two points. Eight points are needed for the standard rate, 12 for the enhanced rate. When checking the terminally ill rules, it suggested the probability of dying could be expected within six months. Then the claimant could apply under special rules. But as the prognosis was unknown, with the doctor saying it could be a month, it could be a year, it was unclear whether or not these rules uh, would, would actually be an option, as the doctors couldn't reasonably say whether or not death was likely in six months. Imagine that discussion. Imagine that discussion. Now, <laughs> Joanne's dad and the family hadn't come to terms, terms with the prognosis, so, no, so couldn't claim under the special rules. The process was incredibly difficult and caused a lot of stress. As the special rules option wasn't available, the application had to be followed in the usual way, and PIP was not awarded. And the mobility car was taken away, leaving Joanne's dad unable to attend medical appointments or get shopping due to the rural location with no bus, pass, uh, no bus services. Joanne also sat in the face-to-face -face assessments with her dad, John. She describes the experience as awful. They pushed my dad and pushed my dad until he gave them the answer they wanted. When asked if he could walk 50 yards, he said no. So he was asked again if he could do it and asked if it would be possible to do it even if it took a long time. When again he said no, he was asked if it was an emergency and he absolutely had to walk the 50 yards. Could he do it? At which point he felt so pressurised he said yes. The overview of the assessment said he could reasonably walk five, uh, 50 yards. The assessment process, Mr Deputy Speaker, is deeply humiliating and degrading, putting claimants in a position where they often feel bad about not being able to carry out certain tasks and even asking for the, uh, the additional assistance in the form of benefits. I hope that no one here or watching is ever faced with, a diagno uh, with being diagnosed with cancer or motor neuron disease or any other terminal illness. Yet it happens to people every day, and it must be absolutely shattering, not only for those diagnosed, but for their families too. I imagine the last thing on their minds would be going through the hoops to get the basic financial support that they need, yet that's what universal credit in its current form means. The, I mentioned the uh, MND Association earlier, and they put forward the proposition that the, the, the fact that this is a devastating disease, a fatal and rapidly progressing a disease which goes through the brain and central nervous system, leaving people trapped in a failing body, unable to move, walk, talk, swallow, eventually breathe. It kills one-third of people within the first year and more than a half of them within two years. Some, a small number, survive longer. And people with MND and other long term uh, other terminal illnesses and families face, a f face significant financial burden burdens, with the estimate being put at a cost of an extra twelve thousand pounds per year. Universal credit needs to work smoothly for the terminal ill. If it doesn't, it doesn't nothing sorry, it needs to work smoothly for the terminal ill. When it doesn't, 
It, when it doesn't, and universal credit, credit doesn't, there is nothing like it for causing stress. They don't and shouldn't need to suffer delays, stress, and the financial burden is the last thing they should be asked to face. It should be easy, but not everyone can use the online portal. Many are simply unable to type. Completing an online application is described by those assisting as extremely arduous, time-consuming and often requiring outside help. Yet this help is only available through a telephone line. That is clearly inappropriate for anyone who is unable to speak. The severe disability premium has been abolished under universal credit, costing disabled adults with no carer £62.45 pence a week. That's £3,250 a year, by the way. The enhanced disability premium was abolished under universal credit, costing disabled adults under pension age £15.90 per week. The DWP's stipulation that claimants who are terminally ill can only apply via special rules if death can be reasonably expected within six months does not work for many with terminal illness. Health professionals are often confused by, the condition, by that condition and whether or not they should sign the form known as a DS 1500. This means that people often do not get swift support, the swift support that they badly need. And whether or not people are applying under special rules, there is no customer journey specific to claimants with disabilities or vulnerabilities, especially the terminally ill. Severe and progressive conditions uh, for including uh, terminal illness, are, off, are all asked work-focused intervie uh, interviews. That is clearly insensitive. Some people, as I mentioned earlier, do not want their doctor to tell them they are dying, and it is cruel to ask them to self-certify their fate, cruel and unnecessary. So, In conclusion, I would ask the Minister some simple asks that I believe he can, he can agree to, given the relatively low number of terminally ill claimants, and these would be either low cost or no cost. For terminally ill people, remove the waiting time. It should not be there. Make the application simpler. It should be easy to do that for this limited number of people. Provide direct support or give implicit consent for agencies to do that on the claimant's behalf. Reinstate the severe disability allowance for terminally ill people and reinstate the enhanced disability premium for the terminally ill too. Provide a specific journey for the terminally ill and special rules. Allow the DS1500 to be submitted without, uh, the, without explicit uh, with the implicit consent, uh, consent for third parties. And finally, and ease, most easily of all, get rid of the cruel requirement for self certification. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Inverness, Nairn, Badenoch, and Strathspray, for securing this debate this evening on this. On, on, this important, on this important matter. These are, of course, extremely difficult uh, situations that we're discussing, and we, in turn, must always be careful to treat them with the very highest level of sensitivity. Um, if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will first set out the recently uh, announced changes to universal credit, which, of course, apply across uh, all, uh, all recipients, and then come to address specific points uh, the Honourable Member has made. Uh, we continue to roll out universal credit gradually, constantly improving the way the system works uh, as we do. Uh, and I'm sure honourable and right honourable members uh, across the House will welcome the changes to universal credit that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, announced in his statement to the House uh, last Thursday. Next month, new guidance will be issued to staff to ensure that claimants in the private rented sector who have their housing benefit paid directly to landlords are offered that option when they join universal credit. From January, we will make two changes to uh, advances. First, the period over which an advance is recovered uh, will increase from maximum six to 12 months, making it easier for claimants to manage their finances. That will apply regardless of the level of advance uh, claimed. Secondly, uh, we are increasing the amount uh, of support a claimant can receive uh, through that from up to 50% of their estimated entitlement to up to 100%. And of course, that is 
uh, interest free. If someone is in immediate need, then we can uh, fast track the payments, they'll receive it on the, on the same day. In practice, this means that new claimants uh, in December could already receive an advance of up to that 50% of their uh, estimated overall entitlement and may receive a second advance to take it up to 100% uh, in, the, in the new year. Taken with the first uh, scheduled payment, that means that claimants in need could receive uh, nearly double the amount in cash that they would previously have received over that period. Uh, in addition, from spring next year, we'll make it possible to apply for an advance online, further increasing accessibility for those who need it. Uh, and from February, we'll remove the uh, seven-day waiting period, uh, reducing the length of time claimants might wait to receive their first full payment. From April, uh, for new claimants already receiving support towards their housing costs, we'll provide an additional payment of uh, two weeks of their housing benefit to support them as they transition uh, to universal credit, helping to address the issue of rent arrears for those who most need it. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think... Um, it's important that I explain that PIP, personal independence payment, is a separate benefit uh, to, universal, uh, to universal credit and, we will, and will continue to be paid uh, weekly uh, in advance to provide uh, important financial support to help meet the additional costs of disability for those people in the latter stages of their life. Uh, PIP is also not taken into account when assessing uh, entitlement to to, to universal credit. To be clear, PIP is not a benefit being replaced by universal, uh, universal credit. Uh, PIP and UC are not comparable as they're not intended uh, for, the, for the same thing. Um, Income-related ESA, Employment Support Allowance, uh, and the linked uh, disability premiums, including the severe uh, disability premium, are being replaced by universal credit uh, as part of the process of simplifying the benefits uh, processes uh, and to, to help us to address uh, overlaps. Universal credit has two disability uh, elements for adults to mirror the design uh, of ESA. Uh, the higher rate is set at a, a substantially higher uh, level than the equivalent uh, support group uh, level uh, in ESA. And by structuring the rates uh, in this way, the government has made clear that it was not looking to make uh, savings. Transitional protection will also be provided for those claimants who move on to universal credit as a result of DWP transferring them across to universal credit if they haven't had a change of uh, circumstances. Mr Deputy Speaker, we'll continue to listen, <coughs> excuse me, we'll continue to listen and act on feedback uh, as we roll out universal credit. I, I regret to say that in any benefit system, mistakes can be made. As I say, that is a matter of, 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 of regret, but when errors happen, I am, I am sorry. We, we recognise, of course, that people with uh, health conditions or disabilities faced, face extra challenges in their lives. People may be dealing with more than one condition or disability uh, at any time, uh, and the same conditions can, of course, affect uh, different people in different ways. Well, for the Minister uh, to, for allowing me to uh, intervene. I'd like to clarify if he will take on board some of the specific points that I raised that were easy to do, that would cost nothing, specifically the issues around uh, self-certification. Um, but there were other points in there that I made too which are very easy to deliver. Will he consider any of those? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, perhaps if, 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 if he'll allow me to, to, to go on. Um, as we roll out universal credit, we're absolutely committed to ensuring that terminally ill patients are, are treated with the utmost sensitivity and care and receive the support that they need uh, to make a claim to universal credit. It may, I think, be helpful if I briefly set out to the House how the claim process works in the pre-existing system, in the, in the legacy benefit system. Uh, in that system, additional financial support can be obtained by someone who is terminally ill by making a claim to ESA. This is a manual process that requires completion of an application through a telephone call uh, or a paper-based uh, form. As part of this uh, process, the claimant is asked if they would like to, uh, to apply for employment and support allowance under special rules, as he uh, mentioned. For ESA, special rules means someone who has a terminal uh, illness with a prognosis of less than six months. The claimant is asked to provide medical evidence uh, from the GP or medical practitioner confirming this. 
if the claimant has already provided the medical evidence to another part of DWP, the department will confirm this and make a referral to an expedited work capability assess assessment that is entirely clerical, a, 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 a review, of, a review of, of papers. The healthcare professional will provide a report usually within 48 hours confirming the claimant's prognosis uh, and condition to the DWP, who will then be able to award immediate financial support by allocating the claimant to the support group. Universal Credit Full Service is designed, as he mentioned, to be accessed and claimed for online, although a claim can be made uh, over the phone or a home visit can be arranged uh, if needed. Universal Credit has a similar, place in, uh, similar process I'm sorry, in place to support claimants when they have been diagnosed as terminally ill and to make sure that additional support is provided as quickly as possible. Now, I am aware of the uh, concerns raised by the Honourable Gentleman about the process of notifying DWP about a claimant's uh, terminal illness. However, we don't need to change the consent rules in universal credit to support these claimants. We can already accept uh, information directly from claimant representatives, such as claimant appointees and third-party uh, organisations representing the claimant. However, we are also aware that there are instances where this is not happening as uh, intended in some circumstances, and we're working hard to make sure the system does work uh, properly, that all, the, uh, that all the necessary guidance and procedures are in place to support terminally ill claimants and help our operational uh, staff to assist them. As part of the training our staff receive, they're made aware that claimants may not know their prognosis or condition and should not be recording uh, or referring to the nature or detail of their condition on the full service journal uh, or in discussions unless requested by the claimant. Our approach is and always has been that we ensure that terminally ill uh, claimants must of course be treated sensitively and with empathy at all times. When a claim is made to universal credit where the claimant is terminally ill, we want to ensure that claimants receive uh, any uh, eligible additional financial support as quickly as possible. Uh, to make sure this happens quickly, the claimant is asked if they have a terminal illness. Now, we've always asked this question of ESA claimants, but using the terminology of special rules that he mentioned. I must stress that, in effect, the two questions are the same. We change the wording to make it clearer uh, to the individual to, to make sure that people would be able to, uh, to get the support uh, to which they are entitled and which they, and which they need. This applies with new claims and to existing claims on a change of circumstance. Uh, where the, somebody presents with such an illness, they're given the option of continuing with providing further information themselves or receiving uh, support from the DWP to, to do this. Where they indicate they'd like support, this becomes a high priority task for a case manager to telephone the claimant to complete uh, the information gather on their behalf. A home visit, as I say, can also be arranged. The most uh, usual uh, way for claimants to evidence such an illness is, is by providing the form that the Honourable Gentleman referenced, the DS1500, uh, issued for DWP by a GP or a healthcare professional to the claimant or to their representative. Uh, we check our systems immediately and as a matter of course to see if we already hold a DS1500 uh, submitted as part of another claim. Where one is already held, we reuse this for the universal uh, credit claim. Receipt of this information uh, indicates to us that the claimant must receive immediate access to DWP support. This support immediately results in an additional amount of the £318.76 a month included in their universal credit uh, entitlement. This additional amount is payable from the, from the start, from day one of their claim. In addition, the claimant is completely removed from any conditionality uh, requirements. The Department and the Universal Credit Programme have regular meetings with uh, key stakeholders, including Macmillan, Maggie Centres and mine, to understand how our policies are working and to uh, identify and discuss potential areas for improvement. I, I do also recognise that he has encountered uh, Universal Credit claimants who have had issues with the service in his constituency, and as I acknowledged earlier, things can go wrong, and when they do, I am, I am sorry for that. Where these cases involve vulnerable claimants, it's particularly important, of course, that they are uh, escalated, investigated and resolved uh, quickly. And I am aware that he himself has an effective 
direct relationship with the Scotland's complaint resolution team, uh, as well as with our local, uh, as well as with our local operations team, uh, which has helped manage a number of urgent cases to uh, to successful resolution. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as we continue to deliver the uh, full universal credit service now available in 178 job centres with its expanded claimant base. We're continuing to review uh, and further develop the customer journey for claimants with complex needs, including how we support terminally ill claimants to engage in the process. And in that context, I welcome the uh, honourable gentleman bringing this debate to the, to the floor of the House uh, today and raising the important issues that he has. I do recognise there are areas for improvement in the service. Uh, but the Honourable uh, Gentleman has seen for himself, I believe, the drive, commitment and passion that so many of our staff, stakeholders and people working across uh, Universal Credit have to see this important uh, reform through. Thank you. The question is, this House do now adjourn. As many other opinions say, aye. aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order.